We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. Hebrews chapter 10. Next month it will be 33 years uh, since I left a, a pew a little bit back uh, towards the middle. Uh, Reggie Rempel was preaching. He's a deaf evangelist. And uh, the Holy Spirit just wouldn't leave me alone. Uh, I was, I suppose, out of his will at that time. And uh, I felt timid, shy. There's no way, God, I could do what you're asking me to do. And here was a deaf man preaching. And the Holy Spirit said, Luke, if I can use him, I can use you. And if you don't surrender tonight, I'm never going to use you like I want to use you. And so I came down here and met Bob Folger. He opened up his Bible to Luke 9, 62. Show me the scripture, no man, having put his hand to the plowing, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And I uh, made a decision that night to uh, go away to Bible college. And uh, so now, 33 years later, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to serve at Cleveland Baptist Church. I want to give you a quick update on two of our children. Alyssa and Drew are living out in Vancouver, Washington. They've been out there for this March will be five years and uh, they just took a vote uh, to call Drew as the next senior pastor, and he received 100% of the vote. So we're excited uh, this summer. Uh, Drew will take over that pastorate uh, with Alyssa uh, by his side. And then Mark uh, is graduating from college, and uh, he just uh, was able to sign a contract for two years to travel uh, for Pensacola to be a, a rep for them. So excited about how the Lord is using them. And appreciate your prayers uh, for, for family. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to tear apart a couple of verses, this being a Bible study. And uh, we're going to look at the believer's reality. The believer's reality. It starts there in uh, verse 32. Luke, or of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated... Ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For, he, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And will not tarry. As we think about uh, this portion of Scripture tonight and the uh, believer's uh, reality, uh, we consider uh, that reality often sinks in after you've made some sort of decision. Uh, it could be uh, an agreement, it could be a contract. Uh, it could be uh, uh, through a job, uh, through the purchase of a car purchase of a home, or maybe a purchase of a timeshare. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we get on the other side of maybe signing a contract or making some type of expensive per, uh, purchase, and we stop and perhaps even consider, what did I just do? Uh, I'm going to have to own up to this contract. I'm going to have to live up to this contract. Well, let me just tell you that the decision that was made, and I trust it was made by every individual here, if not, tonight would be the best night to accept Christ as your Savior, but the decision to become born again, to accept Christ, to know that your sins are forgiven, uh, that brought with it a new or a better covenant. In Hebrews, you're there in chapter 10, if uh, you look at chapter 8 and verse 6, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, the Bible says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, 
which was established upon better promises. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact of uh, Scripture tells us there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so with that decision, the choice that you made, the covenant that was given between you and God, it was made by Jesus Christ in the death that he provided at Calvary. And as we think about the book of Hebrews for our Bible study tonight, there's a key word in this book. It's found 12 times, and it's the word better. You know, as you think about life, as you think about the choices that people make, sometimes we choose uh, between maybe something that is just okay, or we could look at something and say, well, that would be so much better. And I'm amazed sometimes as I look out at the world and as I consider... Uh, perhaps it's even some acquaintances that I've had over uh, life's um, tour. And I see uh, sometimes people satisfied with just living life for themselves. I see sometimes people uh, living life just to maybe get a little bit of money, uh, just to purchase a nice home, to purchase a nice car. And I think about what Christ gives to an individual, and I think of how much better that is. As we think about uh, the book of Hebrews, it's written to the Jewish people, and it was written in an effort to help them understand that the Messiah had come. Uh, We know, we understand that in the Old Testament, it spoke of the Messiah. Uh, The scripture, first chapter of Hebrews tells us that uh, holy men, the, the, the prophets of old, Uh, wrote to uh, help see that there would be a Messiah, that he would come one day. And uh, now we understand and realize that Jesus Christ did come in that uh, lonely town of Bethlehem and was born of the Virgin Mary and uh, grew up and and lived his life 33 years and uh, died on the cross. But sadly to say, there were many uh, that refused to admit that that was the Messiah. Uh, There were many that uh, didn't want to uh, recognize truth. And it's so interesting how Jesus, when he uh, was on this earth, how he spoke of that in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. How he, when he stood before Pilate, when he was being tried, uh, when the question was asked, what is truth? How it was staring them right in the face. And yet people refuse to accept it. People don't want to listen to it. They're they're not willing to admit it. But again, Paul, we believe, wrote this uh, letter to the Hebrew people and uh, is written again to help them understand that the Messiah had come. As we think about reality, we uh, understand that uh, really there's two families. It doesn't matter where a person was born or to whom they were born, a person is born, Scripture tells us, in sin. And because of that, the Scripture helps us to understand that they're in the family of the devil. Uh, It is at a time of rebirth, of being born again, a time when they recognize that they are a sinner, that they they owe a a payment for that sin, and they accept uh, the gift of uh, salvation, It's at that time that now they're taken from the family of Satan and they're placed in the family of God. And as we think about this, uh, consider, you know, there's there's right and wrong. Uh, There's uh, truth and lies. There's good and evil. And all this stems from two families, uh, either from the family of God or the family of Satan. And so as Paul is writing to the uh, new believers, as he's writing to uh, those uh, to help them understand this, we come to chapter 10. And chapter 10 is unique because there are several several things that that he identifies in this chapter to help us. Even though this was written some 2,000 years ago, it is very relevant to us today. Uh, And that's the awesome reality of Scripture is that we can read what was written thousands of years ago, and yet we'll stop and we'll pause and we'll say, oh, he's talking about me, or, or that's, that's my family, or this is my job situation, 
or this is my relationship with God, this is my relationship with man. And we look at that and we look, why? Because this is Jesus Christ, this is the Word. And the Word comes alive and, and it helps us to, to understand purpose in life. And so he gives them that challenge of verse 25 to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And, and then he goes on to uh, verse 31 and uh, makes this statement. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And after that, he gives us what we want to look at in the believer's reality. So let's pray and ask for God's help in our message. Father, we thank you for the time that we have to open up your scripture. And Lord, we think about the uh, family of God. We think about believers. We think about uh, this uh, relationship being the, the sole meaning for why Christ came to earth. And all that you endured, all that, Lord Jesus, you went through, uh, was so that we might be adopted into the family of God, so that we might uh, have our sins forgiven, so that we might attain uh, eternal life. And Lord, as we consider th these scriptures that were written, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be reminded of some of these things. I'm sure uh, we have folks in our room tonight that uh, had a long day at work. Uh, perhaps even some of the illustrations, some of the points that it will be made tonight, they'll be able to relate to firsthand from what happened, what took place at work. Perhaps there are others that are going through some difficulties at home, and Lord, I just ask that this scripture, as we divide your word, that it would be a help and that it would nourish us spiritually. Lord, we think about the um, battle that's taking place and the fighting against uh, the world and, and the devil. And Lord, tonight we need to be nourished. We need to hear from you. We need your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts, to guide us into truth. And Lord, just help this uh, message to, to do what you desire it to do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as we think about here in the beginning of our message here, it, it mentions, but call to remembrance the former days. So Paul is telling the, the, the people, remember when you got saved. Remember when your life was illuminated. Uh, you were living in darkness. Paul talks about this. There are many references in the New Testament where he will make reference to the, the darkness that he was in, but then what happened? He... he he came to light. It, it, Jesus Christ, who is the light, provided that for him. And we understand what Paul told the church of Corinth, that the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of those who don't believe, lest the light of the gospel would shine in unto them. And so he's saying, listen, remember back. Remember when you were in darkness, but now you've come to light. And I just want you to pause and think about that. Perhaps tonight we could do the same. We could just pause and think back. For some of you, you may be going back 50 years. For others, it may just be five months. For others, it could be uh, sometime in between. But he says, I want you to remember the former days. I want you to remember the change that took place in your life after ye were illuminated. In other words, knowledge was given to you and you acted on that knowledge. Now, how did that happen? Well, that was God working in you. God calls us. He draws us to him. And scripture says, if I be lifted up, talking about Jesus, I will draw all men unto me. And so that's why we fervently preach the word. That's why we hand out tracts. That's why we... Uh, you know, share things uh, through the internet or through any means possible so that the, the person, their mind can be illuminated, their, the, the light could shine into them and God can call them to his salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Memorize that many, many years ago and that really is an evidence of our salvation, the fact that there, there's a change. 
Uh, things aren't the way they used to be. What makes us different? Well, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us and He guides us unto that truth. 1 Peter 2.12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they, ha- which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know what that tells me? That tells me that uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Those things that have become new are now a light to the unsaved. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. And so that's uh, something that, you know, Paul is stopping and he's saying, I want you to remember, I want you to think back uh, to how it was when you were illuminated when your life was changed. I don't know how many here tonight know of a a gentleman. He has passed away, but he was an evangelist for, I don't know, probably some 40, 45, maybe 50 years. His name was Carl Hatch. And Carl Hatch has just an incredible testimony. I would challenge you uh, to just Google his name, and his his life story is found. uh, You can listen to it online. He uh, became an alcoholic at 14 years of age. He, that's where he got a job. He was working with his older brother in a bar. And he would, uh, back in those days, just you know, keep the, uh, the furnace going, and he would clean and sweep the floors. And, uh, but there was a guy in the bar who would just feed him alcohol. And so by the time he was 14, he was an alcoholic. And the story goes on, and I, have no, I don't have any amount of time to share the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you some highlights of it. He married a young woman, and uh, they uh, had no place to live. They were actually homeless, living in a car. And she woke up one day and said, is this all there is to life? And he says, yes, it is, and if you don't like it, I'll kill you. Well, he was able to get a job, and he, was able, he worked for General Motors, got a job, and he was able to buy a small home in Flint, Michigan. And he moved in next to a Baptist preacher. And as he was painting and as he was fixing up that house, the Baptist preacher came over and said, Hey, neighbor, good to have you. He said, Oh, okay. He said, uh, Can I help you paint? And he said, Sure, if you want. You know, and so the, the guy came in and, and started to help paint. And uh, Carl just went over and sat down and started drinking. And the guy says, I'm a, or they were just talking, chit chatting. He says, Well, I'm a Baptist preacher. And he said, You're what? So I'm a Baptist preacher. He said, you see that door? You hit that door and you never come back. And he kicked him out of his house, even though he was willing to help paint in his house. Well, the story goes on that this man, every day and each week, would invite him to church. Say, Carl, how about tonight? Carl, how about you and your wife coming over? How about you guys going to church with us? And he would purposely go somewhere else so that he wouldn't have to be invited by this Baptist preacher. Well... One night, again, there's so much in between, but one night he was at a bar and uh, he was drinking and actually bar hopping with a buddy and uh, called his wife and said, I just finished my last drink. I'm coming home and I'm going to kill you. He walked out that bar, he slipped on the curb, hit his head, and he laid there all night in the snow. They found him the next morning, and they, they, they thought he wouldn't make it, but he, he was able to make it. And, and the story goes that finally he opened up to the neighbor, and finally he opened up to salvation, and, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. And he went back into General Motors, and he led over 250 of the workers at General Motors to Christ. He held Bible studies week after week after week. Uh, over 50 of those that, were, that accepted Christ went into full-time Christian service. Well, as the scripture that we're studying tonight says that uh, after you were illuminated, but then it goes on and it says, uh, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. They started to rig jobs on him. There were other guys uh, there that didn't like him being what he was as a believer and a Christian. And he started facing uh, where, where he was called to the office. And, and, and he, but what he realized was he needed to quit that job and go into evangelism. But he was facing those afflictions. And here uh, tonight, I just want to remind us that 
though we are born again, Paul says, think back to that time when your life was changed, but then also think about the fight of afflictions and the difficulties that you've had. Where did those afflictions come from? They, well, they came from uh, accusations. They, they came from reproach. Uh, it, the, it's the idea of uh, expressing disapproval or, or disappointment. Uh, it goes on, the scripture says there, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both, uh, they're talking about what people would do to the believer. Uh, this is the idea of exposing, to, to make a, a spectacle of someone. Have you been there at work? Have you been there in your neighborhood uh, where they make a spectacle of the believer? When I was uh, in Chicago, or I went to Bible school in Indiana, and I, I worked at UPS, and I was able to uh, get into the, uh, a supervisor position. And at the end of each night, we would go up to the room, and we'd have to report our numbers for, for the area that we worked and uh, to, to our floor manager. Well, uh, they knew who, uh, me along with some of the other guys from our Bible college, and there was a couple other Bible colleges in, in that area, and they would always, you know, we're the preacher boys. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, there was some respect by some, but there were others that it was, it was a joke. It was, it was just a mock. And uh, so one night, a, a package uh, burst open in the sword aisle, and it had some ungodly material in it. And so the supervisor, one of them, come up into that room, and it's, it's a, I don't know, probably 12, 15 uh, supervisors, and here we're just getting our numbers ready to turn them in, and he holds this up, and he says, hey, what do you preacher boys think of this? You know, just making a joke, making a mock. Uh, under, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I looked, I grabbed out of his hand, I crumbled it up, and I threw it in the trash. I was amazed that several of the supervisors applauded, and one came over and said, man, I'm glad you did that. Because they're looking, they're, 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 they're almost as a gazing stack, they're watching how we live, they're watching uh, how we react. And so Paul's saying, I want you to remember that. I, I want you to think back to when your life was illuminated, and think back to the fight of afflictions, think back to the time that you were a gazing stock, and uh, be reminded as well what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. That's a strong word, isn't it? Hate. Uh, and yet that's what Jesus said. The world hated me. And because the world hates me, they'll hate you as well. And you know, I think we're definitely living in a day in which there are people who hate what goes on at Cleveland Baptist Church. There are people who hate the stand that you take for life. There are people who hate what the believer does, and uh, we need to be reminded that they hated Jesus as well. As we think about uh, the uh, reproaches, uh, you know, again, sometimes uh, people just come out and, and, and say things that, that are hurtful, uh, say, say things that uh, they, they want to try to kind of put you in a corner. They want to try to see what's going to happen. And it's there that we need to pray and ask for God's help and His grace. Because if we come through, it's often then that that person says, you know what, I want what you have. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of, of, of the emptiness that's found. I'm tired of being betrayed. I'm tired of people turning on me. And I noticed that you didn't turn on me, even though I ridiculed you, even though I, I mocked you, even though I made fun of you. You didn't turn on me. You showed the love of Christ. And that's what I want. So he goes on, he says, uh, not just were they gazing stock, but also partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. I, I like what uh, Paul, oftentimes in his letters, he writes about the encouragement of companionship. He, he writes, he often says, you know, you know, this person's with me, this person's with me, and, and I hope to bring them as well. Uh, and then these others, they're going to meet us and gather here. And, you know, there, there's strength in what we do for each other as believers and, and how we can encourage each other. Here he said that they were uh, companions 
of those who were being mocked. They were companions of those who were the gazing stock, those who uh, were, were being ridiculed. Is that who we are? I, I trust it is that, that we come alongside, uh, that, that we encourage, that we seek to help those who are being uh, or who are struggling. So we think about this this is fellowship, this is partaker, a partner. Uh, they're sticking together. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a familiar portion of Scripture. But I want us to look at this when we consider the, the body of Christ and we consider being companions of them that were so used. There is so much to be said for faithful people. <laughs> and I know that firsthand because my years of ministry here uh, many of those have been through the Sunday school. Uh, they've been through Glory Stars. They've been through TTCW. They've been through the Christian school. And you need faithful people. Uh, you need people that you know are going to be there. And so as we think about this, it, 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 it's not the position you hold or, you know, oh, if, you know, if I had a chance to preach behind this pulpit, you know, I'll be there. You can count on me. Or, you know, if, if I can lead the singing, you know, I'll be there. No, it's there's so many jobs there's so many responsibilities that we need everyone to help and participate in. And so the scripture is very clear here. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. But now are they many members Yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You know, I think about, I, I look out and I see some of the folks who help with our special friends class. And I just love, you know, sometimes I'll be walking the sidewalk out there and I'll hear, I'll hear Mrs. Jones playing the piano. And I'll hear them just singing the top of their lungs uh, the songs to the Lord and to worship. And I kind of would imagine they would fit in that, wouldn't they? The more feeble. Uh, but yet, they're necessary. It's necessary for them to be able to worship the Lord. For them to be able to hear about God's salvation. It goes on in those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Do you see what Paul's saying? Do you see? We, 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 we cannot categorize positions. But rather we need to work together in serving the Lord. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no chism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. As we consider, as we think about that, it ought to thrill us, excite us when a fourth grade bus rider accepts Christ as their Savior. It ought to thrill us, excite us when uh, what we experience on Saturday, the multitude of children here, uh, in the auditorium and, and the patch program. And, and as we think about how that strengthens our homes, as that strengthens our relationships with each other. So he goes on in this scripture and he says, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. He's going on, he's reminding them about, okay, you know, think back to when your life was illuminated. Think back to the change that happened. And, uh, you know, so there was a fight of afflictions. There were some difficulties. But you know what? That didn't cause them to quit. 
they, they, they recognize something. We're going to get to it in a minute. They recognize something. And here now what's happening is that they're giving to Paul. They're giving to others. They're giving to the Lord. As we think about compassion, as we think about love, we need to be reminded that it's an action verb. It's something that we do. Uh, as uh, we consider offerings, uh, have, have, have you realized, have you come to understand, God doesn't need our money. Okay? He can orchestrate things however he sees fit. But he asks us to give our money, why? So that we could be proved. So that we can show faith in him. So that our trust is in him. I just had a chance to, to do a, share elementary chapel with our children. And we're going through the Bible in the Old Testament. And uh, we covered in Deuteronomy where uh, the scripture says that God allowed them to go in the wilderness for 40 years. It was for three specific reasons, right? To prove them, to humble them, and to know what was in their hearts. And don't you know that's why God allows those things in our life? Those afflictions, those difficulties, those trials. He's doing that to, try, to, to prove us, uh, to uh, humble us, to know what's in our heart. What did he want to know? Whether they would obey him or not. Whether they would serve him or not. So knowing they did this, they gave, knowing in themselves or yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. They had a right perspective as to why we give, as to why we help, as to why we support missions, why we support the work of the Lord. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last the next section I want to look at quickly here is uh, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Uh, as uh, Scripture is given there, cast not, therefore, away your confidence. Is that your human, personal confidence? It's, it's your confidence in what God has done. It's your confidence in Him. It's your confidence in what Christ is to you and the work that he has done for you. This confidence is actually, it's a bluntness. It's a uh, assurance. It's being bold. It's being open to, to just speak plainly. That I have all confidence in God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. And as Paul wrote, uh, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has delivered unto us against that day. I didn't get the end of that right, but I, I know who I, who I have believed. No one can take that confidence away. God has given that to us. And what is that confidence? It's a confidence that has a recompense of reward. Recompense is just being paid back. Don't you know that God's going to pay you back for what you do? Don't you know that you can prove him? You can test him and he will, uh, he will give back much more than what we have given him. Our labor is not in vain. What we do will not return void. But as we consider this, I, I like what Paul says. Isn't this encouraging? Ye have need of patience. As we consider the afflictions that we go through, as we consider the investment, as God, God does, God, God puts it on our heart. I, I want you to give that amount of money towards missions. I want you to help that family. I want you to go out of your way. I want you to whatever it is. And, and we stop and think, okay, Lord, what does that mean? How are we going to get through this? And so he says, ye have need of patience. The road can be rough and the path can be dark, but our faith and our trust in God will not go ignored. Here's a reminder that many of you have memorized. Trust in the Lord with all thine hearts. You know, as I think about this, I'm going to finish that in a moment, but there are scriptures that we can quote, we can read, and just kind of 
rest in that. As we think about this patience, that patience is that kind of, let's slow down a little bit. Let's, let's, let's kind of get a better perspective. All right, how do we get that better perspective? By trusting in the Lord with all your hearts. Leaning not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So he's saying you have need of patience. You, you need to trust me. Then he says, after that, you have done the will of God. This is the work that God has called you to do. And don't you know it's different for each of us? Uh, there's a work that he's calling you to do. And, and to me, that's thrilling. That's exciting because, you know, you, you don't have to get a, a certain degree to be part of God's work. You don't have to have a certain IQ. You don't have to have a certain amount of knowledge to be a part of God's work. Carl Hatch the man who the Lord used to lead over 250 people to the Lord at GM. You know what scripture he knew? He knew Rome 10.13. He didn't even know it was called Romans until he studied the scriptures. He, Rome 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and, you know, again, God can use us to do his will. So he says, after that, you have done the will of God. I think about our, uh, the, the, thought that we have for this year, the theme for 2019, to follow forward. Don't let the world, the flesh, and the devil trip you up. Endure those afflictions. Follow forward. Do the will of the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, 5, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Don't you know that you have a ministry? If you have children in here, wow, what a ministry. To raise your children up in, 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 in uh, the admonition of the Lord. Uh, a ministry at work, a ministry at home, a ministry uh, to those who live around you. And then he finishes up here that you might receive the promise. What's the promise? For yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Amen. All these stories, they're true. Acts 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you. Those disciples, those that were there, were speaking to him. What did he just say? He just said, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And he's telling them, he's giving them this commission. He's giving them this challenge. And all of a sudden, this isn't a Hollywood movie. This isn't some make-believe. This is, this is God his son heading up back into heaven. His work was done on earth. He had accomplished what his father asked him to do. He pleased his father. And as he finished that work, as he taught his disciples, as he remained some 40 days and then gave that commission, which is for us as well, he went up into heaven. And you know what the scripture says? He's coming back. He's coming back. What is the believer's reality? Number one, your life is different because of Christ. It, it, it ought to be different. If, if you're born again, if Christ has forgiven you of your sin, your life should be different because of Christ. Number two, your actions will be ridiculed and mocked by the world. That's the reality of a believer. Uh, that's what the devil purpose is. Okay, that's his work. Uh, that's what he sets about to do, uh, to uh, bring this ridicule, to bring this into a life of a believer. What's the real, believer's reality? Number three, your actions will encourage other believers and strengthen the work of God. You have that within your ability to encourage others, to strengthen the work of God. What's the believer's reality? Number four, your work for God will be rewarded. Your work for God will be rewarded. Um, mark it down. He is faithful. 
Uh, he, what he has promised, he will do. Why, why don't we believe that? Because we're surrounded by men. We're, we live with ourselves, and we often fail. We often let others down. Others let us down. And, and so we start to think, well, perhaps maybe that's who God is. No, no, no. No. Listen, he spoke through some 40 different authors over the course of some 1,500 years to record what is his word that we can know that our sins are forgiven, that heaven's our home. And the work that we do, the work we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, will be rewarded.